By the end of the 25th century, political instability within the Terran hegemony was a serious concern. The excessively lavish lifestyles enjoyed by Directors General Theodore Cameron and his daughter Elizabeth had eroded all support for the ruling family. Though they had presided over a period of relative peace, both were at best apathetic to affairs of state, but at worst, undermined the hegemony economy and military. By the time Elizabeth Cameron died of pox in 2501, people were talking openly of dissolving the government. Her daughter, Deborah, promised to be a different kind of leader. Though she was a professor of interstellar politics and diplomatic history, mistrust among the public meant Deborah Cameron only narrowly secured the director generalship, with just 54% voting in support of her. She understood how wasteful her predecessors had been, and quickly set about repairing the damage caused by their most controversial actions. Deborah then turned her attention to her primary political aim, her strategy of aggressive peacemaking. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Hegemony Central Intelligence Bureau worked in tandem to identify disputes between realms and dispatch negotiators to help resolve issues. Many contested worlds existed in a sort of limbo, neither of the claimants able to achieve a decisive victory under the provisions of the Ares Conventions. This made the daily lives of those on planet a constant struggle. Cameron's peacemakers helped bring these stalemates to an end. Two more major actions taken during Deborah's strategy of aggressive peacemaking were their brief and ultimately ineffectual attempts to end the Lyran Civil War in 2505, but also the much more successful resolution to the Second Andurian War in 2530. By the time she retired in 2542, Deborah Cameron was celebrated across the inner sphere, and especially along the Terran hegemony borders, as humanity's finest peacemaker. Her son Joseph vowed to continue her legacy and proceeded to direct more funding into the DFR and HCIB at the expense of other groups. It was the belief of many in the hegemony armed forces that the realm had achieved their success through a technological advantage that was now being wasted. Every day that passed while Cameron was withholding funds, the other realms closed the gap, particularly in Battlemech development. When Joseph appeared to show the same disinterest in military matters as his mother, discontent among the ranks of the officer corps grew. Things came to a head on September 25th, 2549. Captain Henry Green had been a vocal opponent of the Director General and had grown tired of his peers in action. That evening, he took up position in the grounds outside the palace of the Director General at Geneva. 27 hours later, Joseph Cameron made his final fateful journey to his home. He was shot dead as soon as he exited his limo. Two days later, on September 28th, Ian Cameron proclaimed himself the new Director General from his home in Mexico City without waiting for a public election. Some questioned his authority to do so and warned that the hegemony was sliding back towards an absolute monarchy. His pronouncement was jumped on by his rivals in the military and the following day, the Royal Palace and Hegemony Congress at Geneva was seized by the 51st Dragoons under the pretext of preventing Ian Cameron from establishing an authoritarian state. Other warrior cabals within the Hegemony Armed Forces followed their example and went rogue. The Director General issued a fierce warning to the rebels and ordered his household guard to seize the surrounding suburbs. But the problem with his military went deeper than Ian Cameron realised, as the 7th Cavalry, first on the scene at Geneva, started to fracture many within the units wanting to switch sides. Only the intervention of Captain Carlos Dangmer Lee prevented the regiment from breaking apart, saving the 7th Cavalry from certain destruction. Ten days after cutting off power and water to the city, the splintering sub-factions within the Dragoons turned on each other, and then on the closing Loyalist forces. Much of downtown Geneva was demolished in the ensuing mech battle. Despite the Green Devil's superior skills, Cameron's numbers advantage won in the day. A battalion of survivors surrendered that night. The last rebel unit on Lipton was pacified a month later. In the aftermath of the September revolt, roughly 3,000 soldiers were imprisoned for their involvement in the uprising. Ian Cameron responded forcefully, just as he had promised, 
and around a thousand of those prisoners were sentenced to death, the remainder given life sentences. Over the following decades, he restored funding to the hegemony armed forces, while also retiring those generals and admirals whose loyalties he remained uncertain of. In this way, he was able to avoid any further challenges from his military. But nor did he give up on his mother and brother's desire to bring an end to the constant fighting that permeated the Age of War. When the Andurian conflict yet again dragged down in 2556, Ian Cameron saw the opportunity he had been waiting for. Inviting the leaders of House Liao and Marek to peace talks at Geneva, he began laying the groundwork for an alliance that would change the course of human history.